Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, we're going to begin our 15th annual gathering with another in-depth look at the Billy Meyer case. Briefly, why is this case so important? Why, after all these decades, does it continue to generate controversy? Indeed. Our first presenter is going to be Wendell Stevens. Um, Wendell needs no introduction, but let me just say a few words. Wendell was there, first person. He experienced many high strangeness paranormal events surrounding the Billy Meyer case. Stuff that in no way could it possibly happen without literally otherworldly intervention. This case is real, folks, and if you've ever had any doubts about it by the conclusion of this four hours tonight, I think your doubts will vanish. Ladies and gentlemen, Wendell. Hi, Bob. Nice to see so many old friends here. Uh, you know, people still ask me, do you, they come up to me, even here today, and say, do you really believe in this Meyer case? <laughs> and I, I only have one, the first thing I think of is, oh, is he uninformed? <laughs> and then I think if he only had all the information that I have, he wouldn't be asking the question in the first place. So I decided I'd try to tell you why I believe the case and why I believe it could not be anything else but a real case. And it all started <coughs> with uh, after I had been to, the, to Switzerland the second time. I'd been there one time and walked over some of the sites with Billy, and I was convinced that he couldn't have rigged anything to do this. <coughs> and I was trying to convince Lee Elders, a good friend of mine, that I went through the jungles of Ecuador with looking for ruins and all kinds of things. And we'd had a lot of fun together. And he was in a new business of debugging computer systems for big banks looking for leaks of funds. And he was in London uh, bugging out a big bank, doing a job with a big bank there in the London district when I was in Switzerland on my second visit. And I called him in London and I said, you got to come over here and see what I'm seeing because I don't see how this could be faked in any doggone way. Now, let's get our heads together and, and, and have a, I'd like to show you what I've seen. So he did. He came to Switzerland. <coughs> Billy took us to some of the contact sites. He reenacted taking some of the pictures, and we immediately felt the same way, that there is no way he could rig pictures into the scene. There's no way anybody could toss them into the scene. There was no way anything could, could be faked in the deal. And uh, the question of models had come up very early with us, probably earlier than with anybody else. And yes, there was a model, and Billy's desk the first time I got there. And that was uh, almost two years after it started. And when I asked him about it, he said, oh, that was turned on a lathe in a shop school, in a high school shop class by a 12-year-old neighbor boy. And he brought it to me as a, as a present. He said, I took pictures of it, and we tossed it in the air, and we set it in the grass, put it on the fence post. He said, and I made copies of the pictures and gave them to him out of courtesy for his effort. And then others brought him other models made, there was another plastic model made with the bases of aviation, of aircraft models, different, carefully selected for their shape and size, and then glued together one on top of the other or the bottom of the other to get the approximate form of the plate and ships, and that looked pretty good too. And there was one made with paper mache that made by hand that wasn't bad. And people were bringing those to Billy, and, and, and he was graciously accepting the models and putting them on his desk. So there were models, but none of those models appeared in any of the photographs I ever saw. Now, <clears throat> after the second visit with Lee, and we had decided that this might be a sensitive case and that we should not talk about it over the phone. So I was thinking I was going to have to go back a third time, and Lee was about of the op same opinion. And we had mentioned one time over the, my phone to Lee Elders that we ought to go back and take a look at a couple of things again. And he agreed. And then uh, 
he said, uh, well, you should, probably shouldn't talk about this too much. <coughs> he said, uh, meet me at, uh, at Picacho there, halfway between Phoenix and Tucson. We'll talk about it. <coughs> so we did. And we selected a slope on Picacho Peak where we could see all the traffic coming in all directions. And we would meet there and talk about it. And uh, we decided to go back a fourth time. And at that point, uh, we decided not to discuss it on the phone or anything. And we separated. And we started making our arrangements, personal arrangements, to do so. And about two weeks later, we got a letter in the mail, a, a nice, impressive letter <coughs> on blue parchment with silver lettering in the corners. And this letter uh, addressed him personally, dear Mr. Elders, I believe we have things in common that we should probably discuss. At least we should uh, look at things, some things important to both of us. Please contact me by telephone number so-and-so when you get to London. Now, we hadn't told anybody we were going to London yet. And we were traveling on the Laker Airlines at that time where <clears throat> they didn't have a schedule. You bought a ticket and then got in line and waited till they filled the airplane. And then they dispatch it so we could go anytime. And, uh, and that's how we were getting to London. So we could have got in London at any time. Now, we, uh, we decided not to respond to that letter and not to call the number and, and uh, acknowledge anything. So we ignored it. And two weeks later, just a little bit before we were ready to leave, we got another letter. Now, the, the first letter, after saying that, it was signed, Mark Nathan, Secret uh, Secretary General of the Knights Templars of Malta. And it had a Malta address crest in the upper left-hand corner and the top of the, of the page inside. So we thought, what, what interest do the Knights Templars of Malta possibly have in our going to Europe? And, we, the, and then we decided to ignore it. And then, as I said, two weeks later, he got another letter in the mail. This one had gold letters in the upper left-hand corner of the envelope and on the center top of the page. This one was about the same paragraph, so only two short paragraphs that reminded us we hadn't responded to the first letter, that uh, it, it, was, it might be important to both of us to get together when we got to London. Please call telephone number so-and-so, and left it the same telephone number again. And the second letter was signed by Mark Nathan, Secretary General of the House of Commons. So we're thinking, who the hell is this Mark Nathan that is the Secretary General of the Knights Templars of Malta and, and also writing us on House of Commons stationery. <clears throat> and so we decided not to answer that one either. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it, it didn't look very, it, you know, who, why, would, why would you expect something like that? So we went to, San, to Los Angeles, bought, <laughs> bought our ticket on Laker and ended up in Heathrow Airport at London. And, uh, we got off the airplane. Again, it was an unscheduled arrival. We got off the airplane and walked to the lobby end of the terminal there, where you take an escalator down to the tube, down to the subway that goes into London. Now, that subway leaves every five minutes, and you could be on any train out of there any five minutes. We could have stopped for a cup of coffee. We could have stopped to talk to somebody and missed the, different, the train we were headed for. <clears throat> anyway, we got on the subway. Rode into London, got off at, at uh, uh, Victoria Station in downtown London. And we came up the escalator to the train starter platform again, where the taxis would be. And we started for the taxi door. We could see the line of black taxis out the open doors there. When a big black man came up to Lee, tapped him on the shoulder and said, you're Mr. Elders? And he looked at him and said, yes. He said, I have your taxi. Now, we had made arrangements through one of these uh, uh, Fodor's uh, London on $5 a night or something like that. And we had made arrangements to stay at a walk-up in Kensington. We had, a res we had called that guy and made reservations with it. He was an old gunner sergeant from the British Army. And he, he said he had a room for us. And we were intending to go to Kensington to do that. And this, uh, when this taxi driver said he had our cab, and we followed him out. The rest of the cabbies out there in line started yelling and shouting at him and at us because he was supposed to be, we were supposed to take the first taxi in line. And 
he obviously is stealing a passenger from somebody. So he went down the street to the end of the block, crossed the street, and down the other side of the, behind that, just a couple of doors, and here's another London, big London black taxi, and he opened the doors and put us in it. We got in, and he started the engine up, and uh, I said, uh, we, uh, we, we'd like to go down to Kensington, an address in Kensington. He says, I know. And he started on, I looked at Lee, and he looked at me, how the hell does this guy know we're going to Kensington? And he drove around, we didn't know London at the time, and he, he drove around, and we ended up on the north side of Hyde Park at a big apartment hotel there where movie stars lived that was called the Grosvenor House at the time. And our taxi pulled up in front of the Grosvenor House where there was only one taxi unloading spot there, just one with the black and yellow stripes on it. He opened the door and got us out of the taxi, and then he turned around and locked the taxi and led us into the lobby and says, went over to the elevator and said, we were going upstairs, took us up to the fifth floor, and I'm wondering, how long are they going to leave the taxi sitting out there with all of our stuff in it on the only taxi parking spot? <clears throat> and I asked him, and he said, don't worry about it. <clears throat> and uh, so he went, took us down a hallway, about five doors, knocked on the door, and a, a strange knock, like a, a code knock. And the door opened just a little crack with a chain on it. And a round face inside with glasses looked out. And he, they exchanged a couple of words. Then they unchained it, and we went in. And uh, he did, that was entry led into a kind of a, a wet bar. It was a small kitchen with a refrigerator and a small electric range and a wash basin and things like that. And he went to the other end of it, knocked on the, the, the guy inside and knocked on the, the door there, opened it and looked in and said something to somebody inside. Then he swung the door open and said, come on in. <clears throat> and we went into a big living room facing out on Hyde Park. Big picture windows, full wall picture windows facing out on Hyde Park. And there was a black overstuffed chair in one corner over there. The window is here and the wall is there. In the corner, one of those big ones with the fat arms and the fat back, and a red table on one side and a white table on the other. And uh, there was a sofa over here at right angles to it. There was a three cushion sofa, which I sat down on. Then over on this side, there was a two-cushion sofa, kind of like a love seat. Both of them had coffee tables in front of them, heavy oak coffee tables. <clears throat> and uh, I took a seat on the big sofa. I thought Lee and Britt were going to, too, but they took the love seat. And uh, this, the man was standing in front of the big fat chair, and he said, I'm Mark Nathan. And he kind of saluted us like that and sat down. So I sat down, too, and so did Lee and Britt. And as I sat down, I raised up a bit to pull my pants up over my knees. I don't like them tight on, on my knees. <clears throat> and the guy in the corner, Mark Nathan, sat down on his chair. And just as he sat down, the white phone on his right side rang. <clears throat> now this phone rang, ring, 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 ring. Ten rings, ten short rings. And Lee looked at me, and I looked at him, and Britt looked at us, because we knew that that was Billy's code to confirm what a, a mental transmission to remind him that it was confirmed it was really the Palladians that had sent the transmission. And they'd, we'd heard that in Billy's house. We knew what the ring sounded like. And Lee had told me before, he says, he's in the telephone bugging business, debugging business. He says, there's no telephone in the world that can ring 10 short rings. All the telephones have six lobes on the ringing cam. No, it can only ring six rings in combinations, any combination of long or short. But that's all you can get. So when we heard this in Mark Nathan's office there, he picked up the phone and he says, hello, 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 anybody there? No answer. So he looked up at us and he said, uh, that's strange. And Lee said, uh, did you notice the rings? He said, it was a kind of a strange ring, wasn't it? He said, uh, and he still got the phone in his hand. He said, I'll dial the operator and ask her if she rang me. So he dialed the operator and asked her if she had rung her room. She said, no. He said, no, you didn't ring this room? Could anybody else in the hotel ring this room? She said, not yours, not without coming through the desk. He said, well, that's strange. The phone rang. And uh, she said, we don't have any evidence of it. 
and or words to that effect. So he put the white phone down, and he's got a puzzled look on his face, and he starts to speak when the red phone rang 10 short rings. <laughs> they played in signal again. And uh, Lee says, uh, looked at me, and he looked at Britain. He says, did you count the rings on that, Mark? Mark said, no, I didn't count them. Lee says, that's a very important signal. He says, there were 10 short rings. Do you know how anybody could get 10 short rings? And Mark furrowed his brow, and he said, no. He said, I don't believe you can do it on a normal telephone. And he said, of course not. Find out where that, he says, where does that phone go? And he said, that's a, that's a controlled phone. That has a, it has, it's monitored round the clock by a security operator. He said, it's not go, it doesn't go through the hotel main desk. He said, it, but it does, but it goes to a, a, a R central. And he said uh, that he said, I'm the uh, case officer for the London district, which we knew to be the, the head CIA officer in the London area. And they have a security room on, in the upper levels of the hotel that all the telephone calls for the red phone are screened through the security section. You can only get there through the security section. So he called that operator. She said, no, I didn't ring your phone. Nobody rang your phone. Nobody dialed in. Nobody's asked for you. Your phone has been dead. He said, no, it hasn't. It just rang. She said, it didn't rung from here, and I don't know how your phone could ring. He said, well, it just rang. We hung that up, and he said, uh, this is really strange. He said, I don't understand what's going on here. And Lee said, well, I think we do. So he, he said, I understand you're going into Switzerland. Now, we hadn't told him that, but he had that information. <clears throat> we said, yeah, we're going over there to investigate a case. He said, well, he said, you know, that's a, that's a pretty tight group over there. They all know each other, and we haven't been able to get anybody into the group yet. He said, you're our best bet. Would you uh, look for a couple of things for us? We said, sure, why not? He said, well, see uh, how well they're organized, how they live. Uh, tell us what kind of transportation they have. I said, oh, sure, okay. And when we left Mark Nason's office, we agreed we weren't going to go back and tell him anything anyway. That, that was a kind of an isolated interlude. And uh, we went out to Billy's. We told him that at the time that intelligence in London had asked to, to look at some things. He said, I've got nothing to hide. Tell them whatever you want them to hide. Want, want them to know. <clears throat> so when we finished there, we stayed a week. And we lived in Billy's house with him. We uh, ate off at the table with him, just like uh, Michael Horn and a couple others just did here recently. And uh, we had a pleasant visit. We went, worked, walked over the contact sites, the photographic sites primarily. We looked at old landing tracks that were a year and two years old and things like that. Billy was very courteous about driving us around and, and seeing all of this evidence that was there. We also knocked doors at the landing sites to looking for witnesses that Billy never heard anything about and who never heard anything about Billy. And we actually found a couple <coughs> that observed the craft to descend at the right time, at the same time in the same place where Billy had his contact. Then one of them saw it rise away. The other one left the scene and didn't see it again. But uh, they didn't know anything about Billy. And, and he hadn't, had not been in the Swiss papers greatly. They, they had small mentions of something going on, but no story up to that point in the Swiss papers. So uh, he, let's see, where was I? He was, uh, oh, age is terrible, isn't it? Yeah, I was knocking doors. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so we did find other witnesses, and we found a man that was a, a computer programmer he programmed computers that build watches and mechanical parts automatically. So he was no dummy. Uh, he was the programmer that made those things work. And he had come home from work and, and at about 5.30 in the afternoon. Getting out of his car, he saw a silvery disc-shaped craft descending towards uh, a woods about uh, two miles away. And he called his wife. <clears throat> she was at the door waiting for him to get out of his car. And she came out and looked. They both saw the, uh, the ship descend into the trees and then go out of sight behind the trees, <clears throat> apparently landing. They stood there and watched and watched and watched. They waited about 25 minutes, and then the ship emerged and flew away again. So <clears throat> they gave us the time. They went in and wrote the time down on their calendar. 
And when we checked that with Billy, it was one of his contacts in that particular meadow at that particular time on that particular day. So <clears throat> that was just another one of several that we found that uh, told us that something is truly going on that is out of Billy's control because they never heard of him and he never heard of them. So then <clears throat> that was, was quite convincing. And then I was there one day when uh, Billy came back from a contact. Now, we, uh, when we first got there, we tried to follow him into his contacts, and, and he'd always tell us that we, we can't do that, so we'd have to take a devious route until he lost us. And uh, he explained to us one time after that that the reason we can't be accepted in the contacts is because he tried to get his wife into the contacts. He tried to get his best friend, Guido Musburu. He tried to get his children to see the SM Yasi. And after many attempts, and one attempt trying to smuggle a woman psychic that was in the, came to the center there, said that she was in contact with SM Yasi and had invited her. So Billy, trusting her, what she was telling him, put, him, put her on a moped behind him, put a poncho over her, her and was driving to a, a rendezvous in a, in, a, in a woods on January night when it was very cold. And uh, the, the telepathic contact in his head stopped him and said, put the woman off or we'll leave. So he made her get off the moped, left her the poncho, and went, proceeded to the rendezvous and was taken aboard. And they were in a nice warm ship in a warm room and cozy. And he asked him, Yashi, he said, uh, aren't you worried about that poor woman out there? And she said, I didn't bring her. He said, well, she's, it's cold out there, and she doesn't have overshoes. She's standing in her bare shoes. She'll freeze her feet. So he asked, he said, I told you, you shouldn't try to bring anybody into the contacts. You don't listen. And he said, I don't understand this. Why can't I bring somebody into the contact? What's so mysterious about this? And she said, it's very simple. She said, if we allow you to bring one other person into the contact, in our ethic, we cannot deny that person the same urge that you have. He's going to have somebody he wants to see. And she says, that one is going to have somebody else he wants to see. So she said, it, we have no problem entertaining a dozen or a hundred or even a thousand people. But she said, the problem comes when they come from different backgrounds, with different educations, different ideas, and patterns in their head. <clears throat> and they see the same thing and hear the same thing with different eyes and ears, and it comes out different to them. They don't always see and hear things the same way. She said, witness what happens in an accident, and you get the eyewitnesses together. She said, there's quite a bit of difference in, in what was observed. She says, that's factionalism. And she says, a good example of it is the 226, I think she said, different sects in your Christian church all believing they're the primary ver voice, have the primary word, and the rest are all pagans. She says that's because they see things differently. And early on, there were different people who saw things differently. She said, we can't afford that kind of wastefulness of time and effort and for no reason. So she said, it's easier for us to just break off the contact with, with you and find somebody else who does not have these needs than it is for you to bring one more person into the contact. So then Billy accepted that and never tried to take anybody else into him again. And we thought that was very interesting. Now, uh, I was in his house one time when uh, I'd been there for several days already, sleeping in one of their rooms and eating at their table with them. And the men got up and went to work. I, I went to work with them several times because I found out that if you didn't work with them, they're not, you're not going to get much out of them. And I went to haul manure with them. And uh, uh, Billy was able to, to load manure pitch it on with one arm and pitch it off into the garden with one more one arm. And I thought that was remarkable because it was difficult for me with both good arms to throw the, enough loads on to load the, the wagon and then throw it off again. It's quite a job. So anyway, I'm at his house. And this is, uh, we, it had been raining all day the day before and, and the night before also. And this was in the morning. Well, I'd got, I got up early, and Billy got up pretty early, too, but he got up about 7.30 or 7, some, 7 or 7.30, something like that. This morning, he didn't, uh, he came into the living room and sat down on the sofa, and then he leaned over on the sofa and laid down on a pillow. 
And he said he had a bad uh, cold. He said, I, I, I don't feel good. I, I'm not going to be able to go to work today. So the rest of the men all left for work, and I, I didn't bother to go out with him. I was there at the house. And he didn't, uh, he didn't light his cigarette that morning. He was a heavy smoker. Never missed a cigarette in the morning. He didn't light his cigarette. He didn't take his coffee. He didn't eat any breakfast. He took a little bit of water in the middle of the day, but he was, he was still there by 5 o'clock in the afternoon when I was watching the news on the television in the same room with him, but facing the TV, and he's laying on the sofa back here. And I heard a movement, and I turned around and looked at him. He was motioning weakly like that for me to come over. And I bent down and said, what can I do for you, Billy? And he said, get Elsie. So I got Elsie, and he said something to her, and she went and got Billy's wife, Poppy. Together, they picked him up off the sofa and walked him down the hallway to the bedrooms and, and put him in a bath. And then they brought clothes out and started pressing everything, his shorts and all. <clears throat> and they told me that he changed all of his clothes completely from the inside out before he went on a contact. And they were just getting his clothes ready. And they took him into him, and he got dressed, and he came out uh, under his own power, but pretty weak, weakly. They found a jacket for him, and I was surprised to see that the jacket was an American Air Force B-4 aviation jacket. It had the blue mouton collar, blue furry collar, fake furry collar. They put that on him because it was still raining out, not heavy, but light rain. And they were looking for some headgear for him that would, wouldn't get wet, wouldn't uh, just take water. And uh, the other... All the people there worked out and, and came in from work about 6 o'clock or 6.15. The women sat out the table for dinner, and the men ate, and they washed their hands, then came to the table and ate. They all knew what, he was, what was happening. They saw him standing there all dressed and ready to go with his walkie-talkie over his shoulder on one side and his 44 pistol on the, strapped on his side and polished shoes and clean clothes all ready to go. And uh, they finished, and the women started gathering up the, the, the plates on the tables when he got his signal, apparently, because he waved his hand in a little kind of a salute like that and started out the kitchen door. That kitchen door went out two steps down to a landing in a, in a lean-to shed like that, and down to the ground. There was about 10 or 12 steps from that to the end door opening out to the outside, and that was closed with a spring... Uh, uh, a flexible spring. So when he signaled and started out the door, I set my coffee down, cup down so hard I splashed the coffee, ran around the table and out in front of the stove where he had been standing and out the door. And as I came around the table, I looked up at a big round faced clock over the, the cook stove there, a wood cook stove, and I saw that it was 8.25. And I remembered the time because that's exactly what this big round faced clock said. And I started out the door behind him. I got down the door, kitchen door open and down on the ground about uh, just a few steps behind Bill in time to see the outside door closing on his heels. So I ran the eight or so steps as fast as I could, jerked the door open. I, I want to see him go. Even if I can't accompany him, I want to see him pick up how they do it. And when I pulled the door open, it's quiet out there. No flashing lights, no sound, no nothing but the raindrops bouncing in little puddles all over the place. <clears throat> and there was three steps in the mud with the foot with the mud squished up. One, two, three, four like that. No fourth step. The water was just beginning to run back into the footsteps with, where the mud had been squished out. And raindrops were bouncing in little puddles all around, just light raindrops there. But perfectly quiet, no flashing lights, no evidence of nothing. And I stayed out there waiting to see what, if anything, would develop, and I got soaking wet. And I went in and changed clothes, and I came down. Somebody gave me a raincoat to protect me this time when I went out. But the kitchen was quiet. The people inside were quiet. The, the Germans had gone into the living room. They're all standing around in front of the television set there looking at it. So I went in and looked over their shoulder to see what they're looking at, and it was a... It was a black screen with a white cross on it that said in German, the Papa has died, the Pope has died, has passed. And I said, how did he die? They said, there's been no announcement. The program just stopped, and this came up on the screen. Then about that time, they started some dirge music, low dirge music, funeral music, music on, the, on, on the TV. 
So I watched it for a couple of minutes and then went back outside. I don't want to miss him coming back. I missed him going. And I was standing out there in the rain about a half an hour, 45 minutes later, the telephone rang. Now, he got a walkie-talkie so he could tell him when he was down on, by radio, wherever he was. But this phone rang. Somebody upstairs answered the phone and raised the window and hollered out at me and said, uh, he's down, he's over on the other side of the mountain, and you can go with Jacobus and his wife to pick him up. And I thought, on the other side of the mountain, what's he carrying a radio for if he's talking on the telephone? Turned out he was, that, that the radio was line of sight transmission and the mountain was in the way. So he had to use a telephone. He went to a local guest house. So we got on Jacobus Black, in Jacobus Black uh, Volkswagen at the time and splishing and splashing through the mud puddles or up mountain roads, unfinished mountain roads. They were dirt roads with pockets in them full of water and, and finally got to the guest house on the other side of the mountain. And there's Billy standing on the outside fire exit door under a three-board uh, roof, a little, little roof. And he was waiting for us to show up, and he was bone dry. He didn't have any water on his jacket, didn't have any water on his head, his shoes didn't have any mud on the tops of his shoes, just a little bit on the soles where the mud had squished out. And he got in the car. He looked very solemn, and he got in the car. And I was trying to make conversation with him, and I said, have you heard the news? He didn't respond. I said, uh, about the pope, uh, he died. He didn't respond to that. And I said, there's been a no, uh, no announcement. Nobody knows how he died. He turned around slowly and said, his pump. Then he turned back. I said, heart attack? He shook his head and said no, and he didn't want to answer that. So when we got to back to Billy's house, about 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, we went inside, and the Germans all went into the living room and closed the door, meaning that they were going to have a private discussion. And I was out in the kitchen, so I poured me some more coffee and sat down at the table and started to wait. Nobody came out, and nobody came out for a long time. And after midnight, I decided I'll go up and get some sleep. I'll find out in the morning. So I did. And I got up early uh, there, and I went down, made me a cup of coffee, and I sat there and drank coffee and listened to the birds outside. And a young woman came down the stairs from up the upper level and met And I said, uh, what time did the meeting break up last night? She shook her head and said, not last night. I said, well, when? She said, 6 o'clock this morning. I thought, oh, man, it'd be a long time before get, Billy gets up. Can you tell me what happened? He said, oh, I can't tell you. He'll tell you. So I waited some more, and he got up about 9.30. And they fixed him a cup of coffee, and we sat, started to sit down at the kitchen table and drink it, and he jerked his head like that for me to follow him. And we went outside and sat on the patio at a... A uh, metal table with a uh, patio table with a glass top and iron chairs around it. And I said, Gee, Billy, can you tell me what happened last night? He thought a minute and he looked up and looked me straight in the eye and he said, I watched them murder the Pope. I said, Murder the Pope? We don't murder popes these days. That's, that's old historical stuff. It just doesn't happen in modern times. He looked up at me again and he said, I watched them murder the Pope. I said, oh, that, that's unbelievable, unbelievable. He said, I watched it all on viewing screens. He said, we got there five or 10 minutes before. We watched the, that Pope's manservant prepare a warm tea before him, he got in bed each night, Pope Paul VI. And the first scene they showed Billy was the, the manservant in the kitchen in the Vatican preparing the tray with the warm tea on it for the Pope. And there was a cardinal standing there with his hands in his pockets of his cassock, just watching what was going on. Nothing was being said. And the manservant got the tray ready, got the tea ready, and put some lemon on it, got it all ready. And he noticed he didn't have a napkin, so he motioned to the cardinal like that and went out of the room and into an, another closet room to get a, a napkin for the tray. While he was gone, Billy saw that cardinal take a little bottle out of the pocket of his cassock, unstop it, put two drops of liquid into the tea, and then stop it, put it back in his, in his cassock pocket. When the manservant got back, the Pope, that cardinal was standing the same way he was before. And the manservant didn't notice anything. He took the tea in and put it on the bedside table for Pope Paul VI, and, he, and Billy saw all this on the, another viewing screen. And then he left the room. 
And then the, the, the scene switched back to the cardinal standing in the kitchen. The manservant put, started putting things away. The cardinal stood there for four or five minutes and then looked at a clock and then walked back and looked in the pope's room. And apparently satisfied, he closed the door carefully and went to the pope's office and picked up a folder that was laying on the pope's desk ready for a, an announcement to be made the following morning. He put the folder on his arm and walked out with it. And they didn't show him where it went, but they told him uh, he's protesting that we don't do this too. And they showed a, uh, uh, a scene. Uh, well, he was, Billy was protesting, and, and Semyasi said uh, he, this pope had discovered the Vatican losses through the Vatican treasury, hundreds of millions of dollars. And he was going to announce the losses and appoint a commission to investigate it. And she said the commission to investigate it would have involved some of the perpetrators, some of the, those involved in the loss. And they couldn't have this come to light because it would cost them their careers and possibly their lives. So three or four co-conspirators together arranged to get the pope out of the picture before he could make the announcement and make off with the announcement. And that was what, what happened. So Billy's telling me this. I'm still protesting that we, we don't murder popes. This, this is a modern time. We, it just doesn't happen. He said, well, I'll, I can tell you something else that you can watch for. He said, they showed me that the next pope, his successor, would be elected on the largest conclave in the history of the church. Of course, there's more cardinals. It would be elected on the shortest ballot. And in my research, I found there was only one other ballot that short. He'd be elected on the third ballot. It'll take 33 days to verify the ballot. They evidently poll, they poll the cardinals that vote. They verify the ballot, and they said the new pope will take the name. They gave Billy the name that the, that the newly elected pope would be, his given name. And then they said when he was uh, crowned pope, he would take the name John Paul I. And then they added that... Uh, this pope will discover the losses and begin the process all over again. And the co-conspirators act once more. And he'll die by the same hands for the same reason in exactly 33 days, the same time, minutes it took to pull the vote. Now, that's something I could check. And this is only that the, there hasn't even been a proper announcement about the, the pope that was just died. So I made notes of that. And, uh, but I'm still protesting. And Billy said, uh, He's trying to reinforce his position. So he said, again, he said, uh, I can tell you something else, Mr. Stevens. He said, after the short-term pope that will reign 33 days, he will perish by the same hands. He said, then the, 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 the cardinals, the Vatican hierarchy is still in charge of the Vatican. And the hierarchy will decide to elect a pope outside of the Vatican hierarchy. So he has less chance of finding out what's going on. And they gave uh, Billy the name of the second pope to follow Pope John Paul I. Hadn't even been elected yet. They said that second pope will be Cardinal uh, jo something Wasinski. It was, was Pope John Paul II's given name before he became a cardinal or became, became the pope. And they said that he will have a choice. When, after he's crowned pope, he will, he will discover the loss, and he'll have a choice. Either he has to do the right thing and act and suffer the same fate or risk the same fate, or he's going to have to ignore it and, and do nothing about it until he can get some better control in the Vatican. And apparently John Paul II decided to do that. Uh, they told Billy that that new pope from Poland would choose the name John Paul II in honor of the first short-lived pope, the 33-day pope. And he's telling me all of this before any of it happened in, in, in reality. And, and I'm making notes. I've got pages of notes. And uh, he told me more about what would happen after that. He said that uh, the, 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 the church is near its end anyway. It doesn't have long to, to before it collapses of its own weight. And he said that. Uh, that uh, 
Yeah. Can you help me again with where I was? Somebody? Same guy? Oh, okay, yeah. This, this effectively, well, they, they said that the new pope, the Pope uh, John Paul II, after he's elected, the Vatican hierarchy still in charge of affairs in the Vatican will keep him on the road as much as they can. And they said he may become known as the traveling pope, the smiling pope, but he will be exposed to the public much more than any of the other popes before him. Now remember what happened, who, who this guy was, and how he lived his life. He traveled a lot because the Vatican hierarchy kept him on the road. Now I was so disturbed by what he's telling me, and he, he got called to the telephone, and then he had to go out and do something else, and he didn't come back. And I, I'm sitting there pondering all of this and thinking, this just can't happen. This is a modern world. And a, uh, a German journalist that had been sitting in his car waiting to talk to Billy came over to, to say something. First of all, he wanted to know how you could get in touch with Billy. And I said that I don't know where he went, but he was here a few minutes ago. And I'm sitting there, and, and he's wanting to ask me some questions about the case. And I said, uh, you know, you say you're a journalist. Who do you work for? And he said, Blick magazine. That's a German news magazine, like Newsweek. I said, there's a bigger story here than you ever imagined. And I started to tell him what Billy had just told me. And I, I know that I shouldn't have told anybody this, because Billy wasn't ready for me to go blabbing it anywhere. But I couldn't resist. I, 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 I just. It was beyond me. So I told this young man that he should check into the, the death of the pope, have doctors examine it, find out what really happened, because this is the information I have. He didn't believe it either. And then I told him what, that uh, the added information that his successor will be elected on a short ballot. He'll reign and take 33 days to verify it. To be elect, be, uh, he'll live the same number of days and die by the same hands for the same reason. He said, oh, man. He said, I can, get, I can get me a job in the Vatican. I can get my magazine to get myself or somebody else a job in the magazine, and we can watch events and, and do some investigating on Pope John Paul. I said, I sure would recommend that, because this, this kind of stuff shouldn't be going on in the world. This is really diabolic. And he said, I agree. He said, I, I, I'll get something done. Don't you worry. Now, if you'll bring that book cover up on the screen here, a couple of years later, I. He, I got a letter from the guy. He was telling me that, that they had investigated the case and the, the book was in writing. Have you got the book cover back there? OK. So he, this, the, the caller directed me to this book and said, here, this, we got a man in the Vatican working there uh, on a Vatican assignment. He was an employee in the Vatican, and he was in, trying to investigate the, pope, the death of Pope John Paul I when the other pope died, the same way. So now he had fresh clues and fresh information, and he investigated the death of Pope John Paul I and wrote this book in God's name. I don't see it on the screen yet. But it was published by Ballantine Books in this country in English. In paperback, there it is, it's in paperback and hardcover. This is a copy of the hardcover version. I only have one with me. but that describes in detail who the perpetrators were, why they had to do away with the pope, what would, what would happen to them if, they, if, if the, that pope was allowed to continue, and uh, also showing that John Paul had a choice to make that he hadn't made yet. And that, that was very interesting. But uh, I don't know whether you can still find them or not. I, I could only find one in all the bookstores in Tucson, used bookstores, which I brought with me that you can look at on my table back there. Now, the next thing that was very convincing to me was <clears throat> Samyasi came back from uh, a meeting one time when Lee and I were there in the household again, as, you, as we often were. And Billy came back, and uh, by now we knew not to try to follow. We just wait until his contact was over and he'd come back. This time he came back with a note for Lee and I from Samyasi. And this note said, if you only knew what is taking place, in room number, a room name so and so, in hotel so and so, in downtown Zurich, you would be surprised. Then she proceeded to tell us that in that room, num name so and so, in such and such a hotel, served by a waiter by a per particular name that was the only waiter that was allowed into the room at that time, a, a 
of the meeting, that she said that this was a side, a, a very highly classified side meeting of the SALT II negotiations going on in, in, in Geneva at the same time. So Lee and I looked at each other and said, oh, here's another one we can check. We jumped in the car, drove down to Zurich looking for that hotel. Sure enough, it's a pretty good sized hotel in downtown Zurich in the, in the official district. And uh, they had a room by the name we were looking for. We asked about a certain uh, bellboy. There was a bellboy by that name working there. We wanted to talk to him. We asked him if he was serving a room with four men in it. He said, yes. And we said, uh, what room? And he gave us the name that we were looking for. And we said, he said, uh, but I can't get you in there. He says, I'm the only one, only one here that's allowed to go in. So he said, we said, we, well, we've got four names that are participants. And we showed him our slip of paper with the four names on it and asked him if they had name cards. He said he th thought they did. And we said, we'll hang around here until you called in there again for some reason or until you go in to serve the, whatever's going on. See if you can get a look at any of the name tags. And we waited about an hour and a half. And finally, he got in there again, took something in, and came back out. He said, yeah. He said, there, I can see two name tags. And they look very much like those names you've got there. And he pointed to the two of the names. So we, Samyasya had told us that the discussion there, what was taking place was attempting to negotiate an agreement between the Russian government and the United States government to withhold UFO information from their respective populaces for certain reasons, certain reasons of the governments. And they were go going to agree for both sides to withhold information from p public knowledge. And it, we could see how much real information we got out of the government here. So we, are, we, we followed the, the terms of the agreement pretty well, and I believe the Russians did too. But that was, Semyasi gave us the names of the hotel and the place and time and everything else. And that was a little bit convincing. So the next thing that uh, con was convincing to me was the recorded sounds of the spacecraft. Now, we published the sounds, and there had been a lot of debunkers attacking the sounds. But when we came back with the sound, first of all, when Billy said he had recorded sounds, we asked him if we could hear them. And we turned on our little mini recorder and played it with the speaker, or the, the, the mic, next to his audio output on a speaker on his cassette recorder. And we got uh, some pretty good copies of the sound. Not perfect, because it wasn't a, not, it wasn't a hardware transfer. But in investigating the case, uh, he told me that the first recorded sounds were made in the Freck Nature Preserve near Hinwill. And that he was out there with uh, three of his group when they heard the sounds begin, and they lasted for about 10 minutes. And everybody, all, everybody heard the sounds. He was out in the meadow uh, waiting for Semyasi to land and get out of her ship. And, uh, and they were some distance away because they weren't permitted to, en to enter the scene for the same reason that he couldn't take anybody else into the scene. And so I interviewed each of those separate participants in that event to find out what they thought of the sounds. And, and one of them said, well, you know, we thought that he might have been able to play a recording or something in the trees with speakers or something. But they said the, lo the sound was pretty loud. So we carried a recorder and speakers out and put them in the trees and tried to run it as loud as we could. Same sound that he recorded. And we couldn't make it come out anything like he had recorded. So they were convinced that he did not record the sounds. They were beyond the capability of, of them to reproduce with whatever equipment they could get together to do it. So the next sound recording was when a Variation 3 beam, beam ship was on in flight over Schmarbiel uh, Mywinkle. That means it's between the towns of Schmarbiel and Mywinkle. And the, the Variation 3 craft was hovering there at a, at a scheduled rendezvous for Billy. He was vectored to the point. And he got off his moped and set up his cameras to take pictures. And he took pictures. There was a Swiss Army maneuver going on just over the hill from where he was and where the spaceship was hovering. And oh, man, OK. So 
he turned his recorder on and he recorded the sounds of the a Swiss Army jet that was vectored in on the space on the the spacecraft, and that Swiss Army Mystere jet fighter made 22 passes on a variation thrip ship three as Billy recorded it all on his sound recorder. And as the Swiss police drove up in a police car to find out what he was doing there, the military was uh, also wondering about wh what the, the craft was doing. And the, the, the beam ship turned up the sound so loud the police jumped back in their police car, gunned it, and raced out of there in a cloud of dust and left Billy alone. <laughs> now, I, I have a clip of, of other, another sound, but that, that was the first example of a loud UFO sound I've heard. And the next example was before 15 witnesses at uh, Obersodling, and this was a, a, a prearranged rendezvous for, for sound recording and also to convince some of the doubting members. So there was 15 observers near that log pile scene. They were actually only about a half a mile away from the log pile scene. They had one Iowa recorder held by Meyer's wife, Poppy, and Billy had another identical Iowa recorder over his shoulder, and then two small a Sony and, and, and another Iowa portable without, without the needles, the, the intensity needles on them. So when the sound began, Billy turned them all on. And as the crescendo of the sound increased, he, it got so loud he had to take his jacket off and wrap it around his head because his brains were starting to resonate. Then he said his eyeballs began to ache and then, and then his hearing was disturbed. And uh, he recorded 42 minutes of sound in that event. And that sound was so loud that residents of a little town three kilometers away ran into the scene before the recording stopped to find out to see what was causing that strange, loud sound. So I don't have that one here. And, and we've tried to reproduce that in in Michael Pinder's studio out in California, Neil Diamond's studio, they had good studios out there, trying to reproduce the decibels that Billy was hearing, but we were never able to uh, make our eyes hurt or our ears hurt as, as they did for Billy. So I'm gonna play what the sound sounded like, but I'll never be able to get it as high as, as you, Billy heard it. So if you'll go ahead and play that seg sound segment and then gradually turn it up as high as it'll go. That sound, we, we took that sound to the Naval Sound Research Laboratory at Groton, Connecticut, where they claim they have examples of all the sounds, common sounds in the world, and a huge sound bank. <clears throat> and we asked them if they could tell us what the sound was like. They, they said, we can't tell you what's emitting that sound. We can tell you about the other sounds in the picture or on the tape. They said, on that tape, you just heard the, there was a Junkers Ju-52 dropping paratroops. They heard a Pilatus Porter observation plane circling. They heard a Swiss train, and they identified it as a certain kind of steam train. And, the, and they heard the police car arriving with a siren going that would, it came to run Billy off. And all of that they picked up from the sound bank, from their sound identification system, also a, do a barking dog. And we didn't hear a lot of that in and when we listen to it with the naked ear. So that, my, my time is almost up here. I've only got time, four minutes left here for a couple of questions. If anybody has a serious question about what I've said so far, uh, please come to the microphone. And if you'll turn the lights up and let 
Let me see the microphones, please. And then Michael Horn is going to follow me here very shortly. We're going to have to take a break, <clears throat> a brief pause to re-instrument the equipment back there. Also to move the microphone that I'm wearing to Michael Horn's jacket. Yeah, you only got a couple minutes, so you might want to save questions till the very end. Okay. They was, uh, we're down to two minutes now, and we have to get Michael wired up here. So if you'll just save your questions, we're going to have a panel discussion between Michael and I and Christian Freer, who is a Meyer group member that we brought over here to, to tell us what's going on now and, and show us new pictures. So I'm going to, going to terminate this here, and we'll introduce Michael Horn in just a couple of minutes as soon as I can get this sound gear over to him. And thank you very much for your patience. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got another sound piece, huh? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. We're just going to roll right into this. You've heard Wendell's amazing story, probably just a few moments of the, of the year's worth of information that he has. So this slide that you may be seeing here, the biggest hoax of the most important story in all human history, you may have a, an opinion about that, especially the more you hear Wendell speak and when you hear Christian. But we're going to look at that from another light as well. We're going to ask this question, who is the phantom? Who is the phantom? This man packing a 44 Magnum with a foot-long barrel. As you can see, the Swiss cross on his jacket, wearing some de desert garb, a mixture of desert garb and perhaps a bomber jacket. We're going to explore this, who this man is. And to do that, we're going to also look at the connection to these events, from 9-11 all the way down to earthquakes and what have you, into the coming spiritual revolution. To do that, we're going to ask, who is Billy Meyer? We'll see Billy here as a young boy of five to eight years of age, actually. He was five when his contacts first started, with an extraterrestrial human named Sfath. And Meyer's contacts with this man continued until 1953. I'm not going to tell you all the details of things that some of you already know, because I want to tell everybody some of the things that probably most of you don't know. Nonetheless, we'll recap some things that are more or less commonly known. The Pleiaran people, formerly known as the Pleiadians, claim to be, in many cases, the distant descendants of some of our gods, the forefathers of our early civilizations as well. Svath is said to look something like this from a drawing supervised by Billy. And he was uh, allegedly brought to meet Mahatma Gandhi when Billy was Edward Albert Meyer and only 10 years of age. One time meeting in India. There was a parish priest named Father Zimmerman. And Father Zimmerman was the earliest confidant. He encouraged Meyer. Young Edward Meyer came to him a bit concerned about experiences that were unusual that he was having. And Father Zimmerman was a conservative, solid, pillar of the community type of person who nonetheless had a great sense of humor. So we're going to look at some of the events that transpired in Meyer's life in this period of time. 1953, after his contacts and, and uh, teaching experiences with Svath had concluded, Meyer was meeting with a woman named Askett, her race known as the Timur people from what is said to be an adjoining universe to ours, the Dahl universe. And his experiences with her included, we're told, time travel as well as physical travel and travel down deep beneath the Giza Plateau underneath. And we'll, at some future time, and maybe if Christian wants to, we'll tell a little bit about the people known as the Giza intelligences. We won't go into it in depth today, but uh, this is a drawing of Asket. Meyer at 20, Switzerland. Here he is on the road to Tangier. He had joined, for a brief period of time, the French Foreign Legion when he was a young man of 15 or 16 years of age due to certain circumstances, found it not to his liking, and is one of the few people to ever successfully uh, retire from it by marching out across the desert. In the course of a number of years, he was traveling over 150,000 miles, 155,000 miles, through 43 different countries on foot, 
studying the world's major religions and meeting many of the people who would become major players on the world stage. Again, the Phantom, a man who was hired by different uh, law enforcement agencies in countries in the Middle East to bring in for justice serial killers and mass murderers among the more than 300 different occupations that Meyer had during this period of his life when he also found himself in the midst of Jordanian partisans, desert fighters. He's almost virtually in the center with the white headdress. Here he is flanked by two of the palace guards for King Hussein, King Hussein of Jordan. Meyer also met these people you're seeing on the screen here, from Indira Gandhi, Haley Selassie, Franco, Tito, and Saddam Hussein of Iraq when he was just a young thug. We move on to this period of time. We're seeing a photograph here of Meyer on the right. In the middle, behind him is a man who was known as Issa Rashid. And there's another man down below him with his daughter. I believe he was a prince from Poland. We'll talk a little bit more about Issa Rashid later as well and one of the adventures that he had with Billy. Here's Meyer in his kind of uh, nouveau western garb in Pakistan. The gun on his hip, the cowboy hat. Took the name Billy when an American woman from California said that he reminded her of a lot of the heroes from America's old wild west like Wild Bill Hickok and Billy the Kid. This is not exactly Billy the Kid outfit, but <laughs> here he is with a traveling companion, a monkey, emperor or empress. Now, remember Wendell spoke about the uh, Pobal Cheng's experiences when she was a young girl in India. And indeed, when Billy was at the Ashoka Ashram, these were the first photographs that he took of UFOs, of Asket ships, these eight kind of blobs in the, of light in the sky. Then he was able to take a couple clearer photographs of Asket ship, 1964, 42 years ago. There was a newspaper article, 1964, New Delhi Statesman, they wrote about this eccentric young Swiss fellow who claimed to be traveling with people from outer space to different planets. Meyer lost his arm in 1965, about 10 years after he was first told that this would happen to him. It was something that, he was told, could not be altered. It was a matter of his own personal destiny, and he would have to get used to living his life with only one hand. After he did lose his arm in a very dramatic bus accident in Turkey, he claims that he was delirious for almost a full month wandering around. I think he wandered into Syria at that time and said that he was... Uh, doing some shooting at people that weren't there and uh, having other difficulties that would have normally cost him his life. But he knew some people in Syria, like police chiefs, and he was given a pass until he recovered well enough, and he went to Greece, met a woman, eloped with Calliope, and then after they married, his first daughter, his first child, a daughter is born. In 1973, the family is now three children strong, Meyer is working as a night watchman in Switzerland. As Wendell also mentioned, Pobal Cheng came forward some years ago right here at this UFO conference and attested to Billy's truthfulness, the veracity of his claims, and she herself admitted that she had been in the presence of this woman, Asket, who would come into her room at night, and as she was falling asleep, Asket would stroke her hair. She said that she would often awake in the morning feeling like she had more understanding and knowledge, knowledge of people. She said Billy was a truthful man, and reluctantly she kind of came out of her own private retirement, living as a, a married woman and having put in 14 years at the UN, Pobo Chang here with, with Billy. The official contacts, we're going to be looking at this for the rest of this time because they continue up to this day. And they're official because these are the contacts that were intended to be shared broadly with the world in every sense. The, Transcriptions of the conversations, the photographic, video, film, sound, and metal evidence, all of this comprises the official contacts. And Switzerland is a far cry from the deserts of Jordan. It's a beautiful country. Many of you know that, have been there. Meyer in 75, 
without a beard. Semyaze, the name and now fairly well known in UFO circles, is a contact person that Meyer started to have his meetings with in 1975. Her father, who goes by the name of Pata, if you happen to meet him, he's Pata. And this guy that uh, looks like a renegade biker here, this is Quetzal. And they uh, had their bases on Earth until 1995. We know who this is, Wendell Stevens, but let me make a brief mention of Lee and Britt Elders a little more as well. Uh, Wendell was speaking about them. They have their own company, Intercept, and do a lot of counter uh, espionage and counter electronic eavesdropping work. They put up about $100,000 of their own money to fund a lot of this case, the research, the uh, travel investigation. Uh, Wendell didn't even have time to go into how much work was done analyzing the photographs. We have his document. Uh, there's, there's a portion of the document for free on the website, and we've got his CD with the protocols and standards of the photographic testing. So Lee and Britt and Wendell and Tom Welch and Jim Delatosa are all people without whom we would probably know nothing about the Meyer case. So we owe them an enormous thank you. So. Since uh, we didn't see any yet today, many of these photographs you will be familiar with if you have followed the Meyer case, if you have any of the books, tapes, DVDs, etc. In photographs like this where there was a tripod and or a camera in the foreground and one or more objects in the distance, they were set up, as you would imagine, to create some kind of perspective and you could, uh, with testing, as, as you, if you read the... Uh, the protocols and standards of the testing, you'll find out how they were able to determine that these were actually full-size objects some distance from the camera. Now, Professor James Deerdorf, who has done remarkable work in investigating a number of aspects of this case, as this uh, says here, he submitted the following photos to two independent forestry experts. This is a series of shots where Meyer was standing in different locations on a hillside photographing Semyaze's ship. Now, both of these forestry experts identified this as a full-grown mature tree, pruning marks, uh, irregularities in the branches, etc. It was clearly not a model, and I think both of the forestry experts were curious, though, as to what that silver object was. You'll find this next uh, series here on James Deardorff's site, which is also linked from my own. This is a panoramic view of the area in which Meyer took those photographs, but the tree is no longer present. If you look at where the tripod appears to be in this uh, view, slightly to the left of it, you'll be able to tell this in a moment, is where the tree was. Here is a close-up of that area. And now, here is a photograph, one of the photographs you just saw, uh, James overlaid that and then created this composite shot so you can get a sense of the, the actual dynamic and uh, dimensionality of this. There was a tree that fits in very nicely there. You can see how the tree line on the left side of the photograph moves right into the overlaid photograph. It should help if people were at all thinking that that was a model tree. Wendell also spoke about landing tracks the swirled grass patterns that we're familiar with now as uh, they appear in other phenomena known as crop circles. And again, Jim Deardorff comes to the rescue here of helping us exp understand some of this photographic evidence. This is a screen, a capture. You're seeing that triangular object, which isn't the ship, is from a photographic screen. The old ones were used to pull them up and hang it. You're seeing the disc at the top with a time code. Now the arrow pointing up is showing you the bottom of the ship, and the arrow pointing down is showing you the ship over there. So it's apparently in two places at one time. And here, the ship is simply in the next frame, fully, in one frame only, a distance that could be approximated as perhaps a quarter of a mile away. Now, is that a model on a long pole? Well, how do you explain when part of the ship goes behind the hill? On this full film, at this point, the ship then climbs gradually and steadily back up to the center of the screen, expanding in size. If you would measure it from where it is there to where it comes up here, you'll see that this was indeed not a model on a pole. You may be able to um, see this. You might not be hearing the sound. We've just heard the sounds of the ship. Watch the top of the ship and the flange both facing in towards the center 
of the screen, watch for lights which are about to go off here and there. Now watch again the lower part there. Did you see that? I hope. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Because I took that film, as well as a number of others, and, and any number of Myers photographs to these skeptics in 2001. Some of you might have been following my little uh, encounters with the skeptics on internet forums and radio shows. This text here tells a bit of the story. James Randi said it was a hoax. In 2004, CFI West produces six photographs of a cute little UFO model, claimed that they duplicated the effect of Myers photos. Uh, we're on the Art Bell show, and he basically throws the guy off when he refuses to have his photos submitted for testing, as Billy's were. And of course, they never did submit a film. They had said that the film that you just saw was accomplished with a model, and that Myers sat around after he filmed it, and he scratched the negative in places to get the light effect. Well, they certainly uh, have a challenge in this particular ship, and to this day, there's an online forum debate going on with one of the uh, people who's made some nice little photographs of the UFO model himself. He claimed, of course, that this was a model, and he was going to duplicate it and put up a photograph and a video of it, just as Meyer had. You should know that, that more than a month has passed, and this guy's a professional model maker. His name is uh, Mr. Jeff Ritzman, and so far, to date, he has failed to be able to do that or to present something that's comparable to this. Now, because we don't have the sound playing on this right now, you're seeing Billy in the lower hand corner. He's taken a photograph of this object that's, what, maybe 200 to 300 feet away. And what you would be hearing in just a moment here, if, if this was sounding for you, you'd be hearing the zoom on one of the early video cameras as Billy zooms across the field on what is clearly not a little model. I think this has been gauged to be something like 14 feet in diameter. He's asking Quetzal, who's supposedly standing out of camera there, to move the ship around the tree. And Quetzal's going, won't do it. So Billy's a little frustrated with that. Nonetheless, he backs up here. And then you're going to see it from this distance. So if you can duplicate that with your home video camera, and you're a good model maker, and you can make it look like it's stuck to the tree, Go for it. Speaking of unusual lights in the sky, you notice that Billy's photographs are remarkably clear with the exception of the first one from 1964. Now you've got a light in the sky that illuminates the night on the property there in Schmidt It takes an elongated form as Billy gets another photograph of it. And then hovering right over the property there, looking in this photograph and in this one something like a fluorescent bathtub, if I understand correctly, there were dwarf-like beings from the Andromeda galaxy who are semi-physical, semi-material beings hovering about, came to take a look in. There was no contact uh, of any form directly, telepathically or otherwise. They apparently paid their visit and then went and took their light bath somewhere else. When I brought that film with the lights off the UFO, well, I took it over to a company called Uncharted Territory, which did the special effects for Independence Day. And uh, Mark and Volker are the two owners, and they were sitting there, and I showed them that, and I said, by the way, one of the skeptics said this film was made with a model, and the guy scratched the thing with a pin, and they both literally broke out laughing. They said, we know models. That's not a model. And this, of course, what you see on the screen is what they said. Because I said, can you duplicate this? And he said, well, if we could, we have to go to CGI to do it. Those aren't models. We know models. That's not a model. OK, let's go to this. This is a kind of fun stuff. In 2004, these fingerprints and handprints and arm prints appeared on the hood of a car. <laughs> and I was there last year looking at it. They had remained for about a year and change. And they, um, you can see all the papillary lines. And it's very clear. And it's very eerie. We have invited, and Billy's invited, scientific analysis. Linda Moulton House said she was going to get a scientist there. Nobody showed up. If you look down to the lower left-hand corner, there's a silver uh, station wagon there, either a similar one or perhaps the same one, in about the same place that the car was parked when these handprints were discovered. There was a film crew from London that came over last May, Stephen Kemp from WAG TV. And there's Billy. And he's pointing out the prints. And he's pointing out the prints. And if you count from the thumb, from Billy's thumb, you go left to one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the seventh is the thumb. 
You can see part of the handprint, and you can see farther to the left where someone apparently laid their hands down. The story here is these are humanoid extraterrestrials of a different chemical composition. Their skins are kind of the acidic uh, corrosive effect to substances in our world. It etched right into the finish of the car. Maybe Christian will tell you when he gets up here if they're still there or if they buffed them out. But they had lasted about a year and a half last I knew. And uh, once Billy did meet, I think the, the name of the people are Sistana and Ipral, and uh, Billy wanted to shake hands, and maybe Patas said, don't do that, it's not a good idea. So he said he was curious, so he stuck out his finger, and they touched fingers. He said it was burning for a week. It was a real thing. So uh, when we kind of look over this idea of the physical evidence, the weird thing here is, among many weird things, is that the quality, quantity, and variety of it increased after Billy lost his other arm and hand. And indeed, uh, as Wendell would be happy to tell you the details of this, Meyer was offered a film deal. And when, uh, if I understand this correctly, and I'll, I'll be corrected during Q&A, uh, it was when they were making Close Encounters, you notice that Close Encounters doesn't have any daytime footage of UFOs, it's all the nighttime stuff. And Billy had been called by somebody to ask, how do you make those spaceship films witness, I don't need the special effects, I take my camera and when the ship comes, push the button. <laughs> this is something that was reported by uh, Michael Hesseman. I have this on my website too. Apparently the Swiss military set up a battery of radar installations in the Zurich Highlands and they recorded 236 UFO, UFO radar sightings above Billy's property. Now, the Swiss military knows the difference between a military plane, a commercial plane, a hot air balloon, a flock of geese or ducks, swamp gas, or an unidentified flying object, okay? <laughs> so, we won't dwell too much on these photographs. We, they're amply available to you in many ways. This one was taken by Billy from inside, I think, Semyaze ship, out to other discs accompanying them. We want to get right into what I call the higher standard of proof, the prophetic information. This is an abundance of prophetically accurate information that really has been independently corroborated. You are able to do the same thing I have done or anybody else. You can find out for yourself. You won't have to take my word for it. Uh, I have found an absence, a conspicuous absence of erroneous information. Prophecies and predictions are defined for you here as they're understood in the case. Prophecies being the still alterable events that are foretold, and predictions being those things which can no longer be changed, and for certain very specific reasons, some are not told to us with dates and specific times, so that the human tendency to interfere with something which can no longer be interfered with without causing even greater calamity can happen. And of course, prophecies and predictions are made ultimately by those people who have an understanding and acknowledgement and recognition of the laws of cause and effect. Those laws rule the universe. Push it out, and it comes back. We'll visit this idea some more. Now, this is this foolproof numbering system, and this is what has driven a few people crazy, some of the skeptics who've tried to debunk Billy's information. Because Meyer was told that he had to number each sentence spoken to him by any of the extraterrestrials that he would be transcribing later on, and that this would render the documents unalterable, unfalsifiable, because once they had been disseminated broadly in English as well as in Swiss German, let alone Italian, anything else, everything that is numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, such as you may see here where Semyaze speaks and she speaks four sentences and the little cross is for Billy speaking and Pata comes in and then it's back to Semyaze. This way, everybody in the world that has these documents has the same information at the same place with the same number in front of it. And that becomes very important when you start going back and to see, well, was, did Billy really foretell these things? Such as can be found even in, in some of Wendell's books where he put out the early translations in, uh, se several times uh, over in English. Now, we're going to look at this somewhat chronologically. There'll be a few places where we go out of order. Father Zimmerman here had helped Billy to, uh, before he was Billy and just Edward, to put out a letter to 3,000 different people in the world. This is the content of that letter, some of it. Uh, if you're not seeing it, uh, you are now, right? So I, I don't want to read everything to you. You'll be able to get a, a sense of this, and as this fleshes out a bit here, you're going to see just how much he was putting in print and on record before it occurred. 
I mean, things like the climate changes and ozone problems, tectonic plate damage, cross-species pandemics, and then the landslides, floods, weather anomalies. That's, this is the first time he's putting that out. It comes out many times subsequently. And in 1958, he sends a warning letter containing more than 100 specific items to the 25 governments. Look at, this is the uh, copy, a copy of the letter in German. And then I'm going to kind of go through these so we don't run out of time. I'm just going to let you look. Some of the ones that I'll point out would be things like the dissolution of the Soviet Union, reunification of Germany. But don't we all want to know how in 1958 he published a warning of two US wars with Iraq, the second of which leading to an unbelievable disaster almost 50 years ago, 48 years ago. He named AIDS the epidemic. Before that, you see him talking about a fake US moon landing. That's debatable, figured out. Um, plastic credit cards, corporate crime, the formation of the European Union, it goes on. He warns at this time of biochip enslavement. People getting chipped, the EU and the USA being the large commanding perpetrators of this potential dilemma for humankind. He even predicted the crystal meth epidemic and that there would be a German pope after the new millennium. Of course, the two planets beyond Pluto, we've spoken before about this, but here it is. One more. We'll let you look at this one briefly. Here he's speaking about some of the other trends, negative trends in society that will be occurring and are actually occurring now. But the hopeful part about this, that there will be after perhaps hundreds of years, true human beings emerging by the definitions that the play Aaron and Meyer uh, use to, de to define true human beings, peaceful people who are able to express themselves without uh, unwarranted aggression and a number of other things, that we will be speaking one language on Earth and living in the seas and traveling the space stations and eventually becoming cosmic, interplanetary, and maybe quite literally intergalactic citizens. I'm going to show you a lot of these contexts with quotes, and I'm not going to put them all up long enough for you to read each line, and I'll try and give you an overview just so you understand. Here's the date, 1976. We're told about the exploitation of the Earth from the robbing of the gas and oil. We see that there is a, a Stanford University uh, professor who corroborates this years later. Uh, there had also been, and those of you that have the DVD, you know I linked the A-bomb testing warning uh, to discoveries that were published in 1988 as well. But the, the point here about the oil, the, the true and real danger with this petroleum extraction, apart from the fact that we pollute our world so much through burning pet petroleum and, of course, coal and other things, is that we are setting in motion through imbalancing the tectonic plates. We're going to cause an increase in the frequency and intensity of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and those types of things, as we do by overbuilding cities and damming waters and being basically inconsiderate of the way the earth is set up. Uh, now, Wendell knows a lot more about this because he was involved in these investigations when Billy was publishing the specific information about Venus that included these things like the temperatures and wind speeds, magnetic field, the atmospheric composition, coloration of terrain, even the thickness of the cloud bank. And he published that before it had been discovered by about a year. Semyaze is telling Meyer again about how not only will these uh, earth-changing events uh, increase, they will become even stronger. The whole islands and nations may eventually be sinking into waters, largely because we've been so foolish as to weaken the structure of our earth. And again, talking about the increase of floods. I'm jumping here so we can get to some other things before we run out of time. And this is about the space uh, voyage to Jupiter. And uh, Wendell knows about this because Wendell was carrying back information on the 9th of March, 1979, from Billy's contact in 78. And it was three days later, on March 12th, that the corroboration that Io was the most volcanically active body in the solar system was announced by NASA and JPL. And uh, one of the skeptics who tried to prove that Billy had conspired with Wendell to fake this information by going and reading scientific documents that nobody could prove were even available at the time said, Meyer's wrong, the, one of the rings of Jupiter is not 
made out of sulfur ions. And then I found on the internet where I found the rest of it in 1980, there was a corroboration that there was ionized sulfur ring of, of Jupiter. And in 1998, uh, Cornell uh, announces that there's all these dust particles are part of what had formed the rings of Jupiter. There's Jupiter and Europa. Billy had observed it as being ice encrusted, which was validated at the vo uh, when the Voyager got there as well to, to show that Io was the most volcanically active body. And when I called up the professor here, Joseph Averka of uh, Cornell University, the chairman of the astronomy department, and I sent him this Meyer's information, then I called him back and I said, well, what do you say about Meyer publishing this about Io? And he said, well, I'm, he's right. So then I wanted to talk to Dr. Viverka about some of the other things that was in this document, but Dr. Viverka forever vanished from my life and would never take another phone call from me. I don't know why. And NASA did say that that information on Io was the most important discovery of the whole mission. Now, as far back as 58, again in 92 and 96, Billy talks about the two planets to be discovered beyond Pluto, which they were referring to as trans-Pluto and uni, uni, or uni, we will call them something else. Now, in that same batch of documents, Wendell has told me and, and other people, when he wanted that Jupiter information, Billy said to, uh, to Ava, would you print that out for Wendell? The phone rings, Billy goes to get it. Ava prints out the whole contact, which has the no-no stuff in it, the predictions that only were for Billy's eyes at that time. And Wendell, when he found out that he had all this, he had a couple of the gentlemen he knew witness this, sign it, and put it away. The three white, uh, or relatively light-colored, bullet-pointed items there are the ones that had occurred by the time that Wendell had received the document. The other ones here all occurred afterwards, the last one being the assassination of Indira Gandhi. Fully six years after Meyer had the documents and five years after Wendell had them in his possession. Wendell's got a lot of great stories. There was an approach made to the US government in 1979, authorized by the Playarn, composed in Switzerland, and it was stipulating Meyer as the representative. It was turned down, it was refused. This was the opening page of it. In all fairness, I don't think that it was very well thought out by the play Aaron. They um, underestimated just how rigidly we would be reacting to such items as uh, having the American populace informed that all of our religions were based on false premises and things. There was a lot of stuff in here that wasn't going to fly as easily as their ships. So that got shot down. Here is a, a contact from 1980 in which Semyaze forewarns Billy of the assassination of John Lennon. A little later on, did we miss that one? I'll, I'll go back. I think I'll go back. Let's see here. This was the one assassination of John Lennon by a fanatic who suffers from insane ideas. America has lapsed into a religion delusion. This is more information about climate changes, and this is from 1980 regarding Europe, and this was validated in October of 2005 by Dr. Schroeter from Harvard. Foretelling here of the earthquake that would hit uh, Japan on January 19th, 1981, several months in the future, they either got the magnitude wrong or the reporting on the magnitude was wrong. It was foretold to be eight points, and it is said to have been between 6.4 and 6.7, but it did occur on January 19th, 1981, as foretold. This one, Billy had been laughed at soundly because he said the play Aaron told him that uh, when Vesuvius erupts again, it's going to take out Rome and the Vatican, and it's all going to go, and everybody said, foolish, because Naples is where Vesuvius is. Rome has got nothing to do with it until 22 years later, Geo Times reports They've discovered magma chambers 400 square miles, uh, kilometers, pardon me, underneath of Vesuvius. And the play Aaron are basically saying, well, you found some of it, but you haven't found it all. When Vesuvius goes, so goes the Vatican. So Meyer is informed of 29 moons of Saturn at a point at which he thought there were only maybe 10 or 12. Uh, and I think Quetzal had said to him there's actually 16. But 
uh, your scientists are going to misidentify the true number. And Billy said, is that because they're going to think that some of the Adonis asteroids are actually moons and they're not? And he said, that's exactly what's going to happen. So when we finally got to 29, at a certain point, I think they bumped it up to 33, kind of fulfilling that little prophetic information about they're going to go overboard if indeed they're correct. Now, this idea of there being a, a sun system with three, three suns and 16 planets had been laughed at until this Dr. Kanaki from CIT says he had found such a thing, a three, a three sun system with multiple planets. In this particular case, I didn't put it down here, but this is reportedly the play Aaron had found this system, and it was um, the people there had to be actually evacuated to another system because they were overpopulated. This is what we call speculative, yeah? Okay. Now, in 1981, this is something that I happened to have read in 1986. This was the first time I had read what was called at that time, I think, the Prophetian. And I remember reading this particular statement here. France will be destroyed from within and burnt down. The inhabitants themselves are those who lay Paris into rubble and ashes via murder, arson, and revolution. Now, Paris had riots. It hasn't been burned down. And maybe, hopefully, we will never have to say yet. Maybe, because this is a prophecy, we will have the benefit of people taking enough action on whatever levels so that that event doesn't finally occur. But there's more to be said about that. Meyer had been warned that the Vatican banker, Roberto Calvi, did not commit suicide, but he was also said, don't talk about this because the people involved with his actual murder may want to come looking for you if you publicize it. Let it be discovered elsewhere as it occurred 23 years later when the police arrested people and saying the man had indeed been strangled. In 1987, another odd one, spinach genes transferred into pigs. In 2002, Quetzal tells Billy, and 15 years later, that does occur. We know from the Enoch or Henoch prophecies that any number of events appear to have been fulfilled. Let's look at those. Those of you who've read these on the website or in, or in um, Guido's book know that there's some pretty uh, astounding things that are foretold. Hopefully, we can all fulfill the mission of proving them wrong, as many as have not yet occurred. But they did foretell the World Trade Center uh, destruction, it's said here. Now, we come back six years later, or come forward, to a further warning about France. And here we're told that France will ultimately be invaded from the outside and destroyed from within. And this would be due to many foreigners of a different religion living there, specifically people of the Islamic faith, right? Let's go forward in these slides. We're told that gigantic hurricanes, firestorms and gigantic hurricanes are going to ultimately affect our country and other places, but there's going to be enormous devastation because of the way in which we have been maltreating the earth, as well as certain types of weapons that could be used against us if we are not going to alter our course. Now, in 1987, and this has been published now for, I don't know, three, four years, so you can know that you can say, well, did he really publish this then and that? He's foretelling the fanatics of Islam rising up against Europe. We know that there have already been attacks in Europe, and now with the cartoon controversy, we can see that unless people make a lot of effort to make peace and understanding, that some of these things may well be coming our way. The next slide. This talks about a turning point, and there's no dates given. So should the Western nations, the countries, the industrialized countries, continue an onslaught against so-called third world and other countries, eventually the tide would turn where we would have to defend against them. And at this time, there's a possibility, if you read this here. Can you see that? At this time, the possibility could become reality that extraterrestrial forces intervene against the Western industrialized countries. So it is said that a possibility is that a race that I think is somewhere sequestered on the planet would join forces with the opponents of the so-called industrialized countries as they march on this warlike mission. And that would not bode well for any country, no matter what their technology may be. They also foretell two civil wars in America, breaking up into five sections under different uh, unpreventable sectarian fanatics playing a dictatorial role. Do we see any hint that there's fanatical sectarian people afoot trying to enforce their beliefs? 
And here in this last lengthy slide, if you look at the very last part of it, they're talking about all of this unfolding if we allow it to and how weapons will run amok in themselves, the computerized weapons becoming independent and can no longer be controlled by human beings. They state that overall, this is the most important part of Enoch or Henoch's prophecies. This one is a response to Billy when Quetzal is telling him about the coming destruction of the World Trade Center, whereby he says that, certain, that Bush Jr., who of course is nowhere yet near the presidency, and other criminal trusted ones would allow it to take place so that at that time a war against Islam can be launched. And he further state here that the greatest terror to the world would come from the bushes. Quetzal here is talking about Bush Jr. and Blair plotting. This is before the first Gulf War. They're talking about the failure of Bush Sr. to be able to take Saddam Hussein during this projected war, this pr prophetic information, and that consequently later on there would be this fomenting of a war, collaboration with the Bush and Blair and the people in the CIA, blah, blah. We're just moving along into this prophetic information for a reason. Development of human-animal hybrids, we have record of that 10 years later, in 2005. The growing of meat in laboratories, again, June 29th issue of Tissue Engineering reports on the earliest experiments now started to grow fish flesh, just as if you were making cheese or culturing some, some other thing to create meat so that we don't have to use the animals any longer for that. So genetic engineering and manipulation isn't an evil. It's a neutral that can be used either responsibly to improve our lives or to harm us through ignorance and greed. And both things will occur, undoubtedly. As you can see here, Myra again foretold the US attack on Iraq. This was even in the first issue of And Yet They Fly. Uh, the nuclear power plant accident hmm, was happening. It was prevented. It was one of 436 power plants. Here's a warning, the potential of 430, uh, pardon me, of the Third World War happening if four heads of state would die within a week of each other. We're not sure if, if something has qualified for this yet or not. 1997, Myers told of the cover-up actually starting in 1915. I'll cover more of this in question and answer period if you want, how the, about five or six of the U.S. presidents were involved in this, that the, there were several popes, that the Orson Welles, H.G. Wells broadcast was also a pivotal piece of this, and how so much of the so-called evil alien, alien abduction, all of this stuff is disinformation and misinformation. We didn't say all. We said, according to this, most, and how most U.S. sightings are terrestrial craft. There is a warning in this case from the La Palma volcano. When it erupts, if the U.S. is not prepared for it, we would lose 20 million people along the eastern seaboard. Again, the laws of cause and effect, that pendulum, what are we being told here? Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap, do unto others. These are wonderful things that have appeared in our holy books and are true. So if we look at the U.S. having 200 unprovoked attacks against other countries, unprovoked, they didn't attack us, what can we expect? What's our homework? Well, to avoid the war, we've got to get out of these countries. Simple statements. I don't know if it's that easy to do. We've got to change our thinking, our speaking, our acting, our beliefs, and stop all the aggression, because according to the play Iron and Meyer, we cannot win the war on terrorism through military means. So we're told we get this or we get that. It's up to us. There is a coming spiritual revolution. We have to make distinctions. I've run through a whole lot of information here. You have to find out what's speculative, what's factual. Can you prove any of that? Because we have to leave behind the age of beliefs for the age of knowledge. We can no longer say what's in this book is true because the book says it's true. That isn't admissible anywhere. It's not admissible in education. It isn't admissible in law. And yet we allow ourselves to create cults and religions and to destroy ourselves in the world based on that kind of lack of thinking. <laughs> As Asket told Meyer back in 1956, unfortunately, it's going to be the earthly religions that are going to contribute monumentally to this forthcoming destruction, fundamentalism, all of this stuff. 
great powers will align with different religions, be controlled or influenced by them, and unless human beings wake up and enter this age of knowledge, we get what we don't want. There are core principles, and the primary one here is self-responsibility. For everything we think, we express, we believe, what we do. And we have to leave behind all of these other surrogates in our lives. Religions, cults, politics, and false leaders. Because thinking for ourselves is the only way out. That's where the wisdom will be found. The leadership is only going to come from the bottom up. That's us. And so we have to become truthful with ourselves and with each other. Diplomacy is a form of lying. <laughs> and if you really think on that, what is that about where we won't really tell our truth to another person? Nobody here, myself included, anybody here, we all hedge it and fudge it. We got to get over that. Because peace is fighting the battle first within ourselves. And then we've been told by the player, you got to clean this one up too. What is that? Peace symbol, we've got it upside down. Upside down, yeah, it's a sword. It's a, the cross of Peter. It's all the stuff running into the ground. Get the tree of life. Bring it up. Here, they say, is what the original peace symbol, one of 1.2 million symbols that Meyer was taught as a child to receive telepathically and translate into German when he types it out at 60 words a minute with one hand. This is what it looks like, and this is what it looks like in color. Oh, move it right along. Turn it right side up. Here, there is a peace meditation that is allegedly done by 3.2 billion extraterrestrial humans on our behalf. While we, some few thousand people on the planet, are doing this, you can learn about this. You can do it yourself. It takes 20 minutes. It's allegedly the ancient Lyrian language. Salome, Gamnan, Ben Urda, Ganiber, Asala, Hesporona, peace be on earth and among all beings. There's more information on that on my website, on the Figu website. Uh, 20 minutes, once a month, twice a month, if you wish. Now, this we're going to move through kind of uh, quickly. It was alluded to before. We mentioned Isa Rashid. He was the co-discoverer, along with Billy, of what's known as the Talmud of Emmanuel, co-discovered by them in 1963. This is given after they dig their way into what is an abandoned tomb near Jerusalem. They, it's very, very ancient. Stones on the floor, unearth the stones. Pick up the resin-wrapped animal skins that are protecting the scrolls inside that are written, they find out, in Aramaic, which Isa Rashid just seems to know how to translate. He takes the scrolls. He runs back to Jerusalem, sequesters himself away, but he has to leave. He sends them off to, to Meyer in 1970, after seven years of work. In 74, he and his family flee to Lebanon. They sequester the scrolls in a house in, in a refugee camp. The Israelis come in. They destroy that camp. The scrolls are gone forever. Rashid and his family escape ultimately into Iraq, but not for long. They're assassinated, allegedly, by the Mossad in 1976 in Baghdad. And in the scrolls, we learn that Judas Iscariot, is the writer but not the betrayer of the man known as Emmanuel, who was never called Jesus in his entire life, never heard himself called that, but knew that he would be called that name, a false name, as it is told in, in the Talmud. Adam's father is said to be Semyaza, an El or a God of the Old Testament, an extraterrestrial leader. We learn that indeed Emmanuel's father was named Gabriel. He was a playaron. And that Emmanuel was the fifth prophet in a very specific lineage with a very specific task. And that he knew and that he had to walk through his own trial in the form of the crucifixion, which it is said here he survived. And that afterwards, he travels to India with his family, a number of people. He marries an Indian woman, not Mary Magdalene an Indian woman, and as they say, he bears numerous descendants. I think a son was named Joseph, who, after Emmanuel dies many years, 70 years or so after the crucifixion, takes the scrolls back to the original tomb of the crucifixion and sequesters them under the stones where they would be found 2,000 years later by Meyer and Isa Rashid. In the Talmud of Emmanuel, the coming of Muhammad and Islam as a cult, 
that would degenerate and cause trouble for many centuries. That is foretold as is the foretelling of land, water, and air vehicles that would be used for war, that there would be atomic and biochemical metallic projectiles, they said, containing the very cornerstones of life and foul air. We, we know what that means. The skies would be darkened by oil fires that would result from the greed of human beings. Now, I don't know if they're referring to those that occurred in, what, 1990 in Kuwait, or if we have more to come. There are many other things in here that are very, very controversial. Emmanuel foretells Israel's fate as being one of termination, unless the Israelis of today make a true and just peace with the distant descendants of the rightful owners of that land, and then they can change the prophecy. There are otherwise great dangers of a new world war, but it would be in this new time that the eternal teachings of what they call the creation, the teachings of creation, would once again be brought into the world, this time to launch this new spiritual revolution, and they would be brought into the world by a simple man, a prophet in this lineage, who would live in a far northern country. At the base of the tomb of, uh, in Shrenagar, of the man there who was known, I think, called Isa, also, are these foot marks. And if you look, you'll see in the center, there are marks in the center of the feet, and these were crucifixion marks. And the legend that accompanied this is something to the effect of, here lies a, a great teacher who was crucified in his own land and who came here to us to teach us. James Deerdorf, who's here, and you hopefully will meet him over this week, he researched not only the photographs and the film evidence, but when he heard about the Talmud of Emmanuel, he thought this was probably another Bible hoax. And Jim spent a good deal of time comparing and looking at this, and he has a companion book to the Talmud, which is called Celestial Teachings, and his conclusion, if I'm getting it right, is that the Talmud of Emmanuel is the original text upon which the book of Matthew is based, having resolved over 200 inconsistencies, a number of which weren't even noted by biblical scholars till after the Talmud had been discovered, let alone translated. So this is stuff to be digested here. But now we have to ask ourselves, well, why has all this occurred? We have Wendell and his stories. The CIA is meeting him. Billy and his group have been under observation for 30 years. And just last year, one of the people wrote a thing and published and said, you know, um, we know we're always being observed, but why don't they just come down and knock on the door and ask us what they want? What do you want to know? There's no secrets here. Wendell had mentioned that. So why are these contacts going on? What's the purpose of them? And this is it. It's to help us, not do it for us, but to help us to assure our future survival so that we can awaken to spiritual reality. No, not more religion. This is not a cult. You don't follow Billy. Don't join anything. Stay away from that idea. We want to know what the eternal truths of creation are so we can struggle through that and understand it and learn about it and lay the foundation for the next 700 years of human development and spiritual growth. Then we get to determine the truth for ourselves, and we get to rewrite our future history. Now, why do I say that? Because after looking at all of these decades, there's 55 years so far of what I've been able to only call prophetically accurate scientific and world event-related information. And I always went, well, why? What's this for? And then I saw the, the Hanak prophecies, and I went, I don't even want to know about this stuff if this could happen. Why are they giving us this? And then the light kind of went on again, and it went, here's 55 years of a base, of a foundation of credibility. Now we're trying to get you to turn your attention over here to this and some other prophecies that will appear in the new publication of the Talmud of Emmanuel, and, and I will notify everybody that is on my mailing list. It will be on my site when that's available. There will be the prophecies, I believe, of Eliah and Isaiah. No, no, Eliah, Jeremiah. That's right, thank you. Uh, Jeremiah. And these are very heavy things, but we're directed towards this. If we can say, okay, there's enough credibility. It's not what's in this book is true because the book says it's true. It's here's the information. You can prove 
enough of this has been published well before it happened. It's credible. There's a foundation. Okay, here's the warning. Hey, let's look at this. Now, I'll have to tell you something real quickly here just because time's going. I, I did a radio show, an interview on WTOP on November 15th or so of last year. That's the largest news station in Washington, D.C. Some funny things came out of that, including an attack from a major law firm. Uh, funny stuff. But... Um, one of the other things that came out of that was that my website, where I get to look at my statistics page, I get visits from people like in 86 countries now that are discovering the Meyer case. And usually I get five to 10 visits from US governmental and US military websites. That week, I had 300 visits from the governmental and military websites. And I was delighted by that, because there's a thing called military intelligence, right? Some of those people really are very intelligent. And if they would get a, you know, if they look at this, and they, they already know about Billy. There's nothing much. They, I don't have to tell them what's good. But if they start to read some of the stuff maybe they haven't read before, and they go, wait a minute, this doesn't look good for us if we keep doing this. So there are people that are getting the Meyer material by eavesdropping on Billy over there, reading the stuff on the websites, seeing the books and the DVDs and all this stuff. Now, I want to just do one little thing about the DVD and the videos. When Wendell talked about his investigation, Lee and Britt Elders uh, put out a video called Contact in, I think, 1982, and they reissued it so that I can make it available to everybody. And it's a reenactment using Billy and Wendell and Lee and Britt and, and many of the people that are still involved in the case in Switzerland. You can see the people there. You can see some of the scientific testing. A guy who reports on the, uh, the lie detector test with Billy and, the, and Wendell's prodding him. Well, was he dishonest about anything? Well, the only thing we found troubling was when we asked him if, if he was still drinking coffee. He, the thing went all over the place because I guess his wife told him to stop drinking coffee and he told her he had and that was where he was that's where it was going off the charts well anyhow contact is a very interesting video as, as many of you know I have a DVD on this and here's what I want to say about it because it, when you spread the word to people and people are saying well you know how do you really know this was really published beforehand and blah blah my DVD the same thing that I talk about in here about the warnings from 1981 and 87 about Islam and France and some other things and Vesuvius those things were validated those things happened after the DVD came out so it's already on a copyrighted pressed item if you need that kind of proof for anybody and there's a ton of other stuff that I didn't do here because a couple years ago when I did a presentation I had a lot of stuff that went on the DVD okay Guido's great book, And Still They Fly. I know many of you have it. We brought it. This is my commercial period here. And that's my website. I do want you to visit the website because um, I have newsletters, and I have an archive of a lot of newsletters. I've got about 20 articles up there, Billy's articles up there. There's something on the Billy's page called Introduction to the Spiritual Teachings, where Samyaze waxes poetic for, I don't know, maybe 200 sentences or more worth about the human spirit and the connection to creation. And it, the creation is the universe in which we live, according to the play Aaron, that which we often think of is when we think of the spirit or God, they don't limit it because they knew that God always referred to the higher, more advanced extraterrestrial humans who weren't always benevolent but represented themselves as the creators of all things. They said, cancel that. The creation, this is the, the consciousness, the intelligence. This is this universe. This is a structure. This isn't even the, the original universe. You're in a young universe. There's already billions of them. There are laws of creation. There are things about creation and its functions. There are steps and developments of, of, that all the human races go through. All the human races? Yeah, they knew of more than 41 million human races in this universe. So there is a ton of information. There are so many things that you can look at and discover for free. I'm linked to many of the sites like James Deardorff and to the FIGU site, to Gaia guys in Australia who are doing really great work with, with Switzerland's permission. They're translating a lot of the things into Germ from German into English that have otherwise been languishing as far as we're concerned because we don't have access to them unless we're German speaking and not enough people are. So there is so much that you can look into that you can decide for yourself and if you want to do something positive, their main suggestion on the self-responsibility issue that I can pick up or try to distill, we have to monitor what we think. We have to become aware of our thoughts, learn to recognize what we're thinking, and whether or not we're going to 
continue that thought, to empower a given thought, or if we're going to choose more preferable thoughts. So in neutrality, we first have to recognize what is. Then we can make a positive choice, thought-wise and action-wise. We cannot simply layer things over with affirmations and expect that to change anything. Because first you have to acknowledge what is. And this is not necessarily news to, to many people here, I'm sure. In that idea of self-responsibility, we monitor the thoughts, we monitor our actions, we notice what we believe unconsciously and habitually, and we start looking for knowledge and truth. We test our beliefs out. We come up against the, the confusion and the discomfort of knowing that we, as simple human beings living on Earth, are as subject to all of the mistakes that anybody else that we might be critical of at any other time because we don't like the way they think or behave. So we get to change it first from within and demonstrate that element of leadership from the ground up by being the living example of our own simple truth, our fallibility. We're not here to be perfect. People make mistakes. That includes Billy, the play Aaron, and all of us. So one thing that won't be a mistake is for you to think about this and to ask questions when you have them and to know that Shortly after this next little break, you're going to be treated to a presentation by Christian Frenner from Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you. Chronicled the beginning of the investigation of